um, to have this round table on return migration in a critical perspective. Um, subtitle is questioning concept and practices in the Mediterranean. Um, I'm very happy for several reasons. First of all, because it takes a very long time to, to organize and finally having this, uh, this round table. Uh, it was originally scheduled for the March of 2020 and all of you may imagine why it has to be postponed to this year. Uh, and finally, we were waiting a long time to understand if it was feasible and was possible to do it presentially in the frame of EMED activities as was, as was uh, planned. Uh, but finally, um, we decided to, to have it uh, in, in this online format. Um, Thank you very much uh, to Jean-Pierre Casarino and Joanna Braviescu uh, to accepting our proposal to, to stay um, available until the last minute, despite of, of the, the, all, all the, the, the situation and, and the waiting time in order to understand if it was feasible or not in, in presential form. Um, also very happy because I think that uh, return uh, and in, in all is ambiguous and dichotomic forms, I think is a very central um, topic in, in both policies and practices nowadays uh, in Europe and beyond, I will see. Um, the return has a very long trajectory uh, in, in, in policies. Now it starts, uh, it start at least in modern times in the mid 70s in Europe with the oil crisis and the attempt of Central European countries um, to to send uh, back uh, the, the, this birds of passage, although we're considering some, in some terms uh, uh, foreign uh, workers, um, or in the case of maquilas in the US and, and Mexico, now those first attempts. Um, someone maybe will say that the first attempt was in, in the formation of Sierra Leone and Ribera with, with black slaves from the United States, but we don't know, it's interesting. Um, idea that maybe we can discuss later on. Um, There's a central uh, nowadays also in, in the European uh, political scene, I mean the last proposal of the new pact for migration or against migration for some other scholars. Um, return seems to be more and more central in, in, in European policy and the European uh, also in the European practices because despite the COVID-19 uh, uh, impact on migration system and on migration policy, it seems that return migration uh, and particularly forced right return or deportation um, is still very central in mind of, of um, European policy makers and stakeholders and also of European uh, countries uh, and the European member states. Uh, and the last uh, EU Council meeting of interior ministries of uh, some days ago, underlines again this, this idea of the centrality of the return policies, the forced return policies, with this proposal of sanctioning third country, they are not collaborating enough in return, um, uh, in accepting the return of their citizens, uh, the forced return of their citizens with uh, some sanction in their visa quota. So it's a very central topic, but despite the centrality in, in policies, uh, it does not from my point of view, uh, the space that it needs. Uh, so I'm very happy because this session will allow us to, uh, to questioning, first of all, concepts, uh, definition, their use, the ambiguity, the dichotomical um, content in some sense, but also uh, it will allow us to understand more largely uh, some of the features of contemporary uh, states uh, in Europe and the use they do of the, the, the management and the control of people, the control of space uh, at the border and beyond. Um, so uh, it's mainly uh, the, the idea, the, the, the fact that, that made me happy to having this uh, round table today. Um, and I think because this, uh, our guest today, Jean-Pierre Casarino and, and Joanna Vrabiescu, um, will allow us to, to think about, first of all, the, con the form that contemporary states are taking, uh, the use of, of, of uh, power towards people, uh, but also because they are put in, in dialogue uh, their uh, theoretical reflection with a very strong knowledge 
of uh, policies and practices. Uh, in the case of Jean-Pierre, extensively uh, between Europe and the foreign and then the neighboring countries, and particularly in the Mediterranean area, I think Jean-Pierre was one of the first scholars to start researching on, on this issue and has a very extensive trajectory on this. And, and in the case of Joanna, that also has, has a long trajectory in studying this in the case of um, uh, deportation of Roma people from uh, European countries, uh, and particularly Spain and, and France. Uh, so it's also interesting for me because we put in dialogue with something that seems to be more Mediterranean with something that the first view do not seem to be central in the Mediterranean as Roma people. But uh, I think uh, that we have to consider that first of all, Mediterranean space has been central historically for Roma people and that Roma people and Spain and, 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 and France are also part of the, the Mediterranean space. Uh, so um, I think it's another very interesting element of the today uh, round table. I will not take too much time uh, to our guest. Um, just introduce them uh, very, very quickly. Jean-Pierre Casarino uh, is based at the College of uh, Europe in Warsaw in Poland nowadays. I will not uh, present all your biography because I think it was available to, to the public today. So uh, I think it's, it's better to give time to you, to your presentation and to the question um, session after this, uh, your, your intervention. And Joana Vrejescu, that's based uh, now is, is a scholar of the University of Warwick uh, in the YIRL Center. Uh, so um, Jean-Pierre, I will give you the floor to start uh, with uh, your presentation that is entitled, if I'm not wrong, The Extraordinary Rationalization of Return Policy. Thank you. Thank you so much, Lorenzo. I'm glad to be here. Uh, thank you so much for the invitation to uh, uh, to greet Tim. Um, happy to speak with you, at least virtually, given the, the conditions anyway. The extraordinary rationalization of return policies, police, political constructs, dichotomies and implications. This is the title of my uh, present short presentation of concepts and notions may change as we enter a new epoch. Various thinkers have already denounced the dangers of fuzzy notions, euphemisms, and metaphors in policy discourses. Their works showed the subtle power of a new lexicon to gradually normalize practices, even the most absurd and cruel in an attempt to categorize people, often with popular consent. One century ago, Edouard Bernays, the architect of uh, propaganda techniques, explained how to shape the mind of the mass, as he put it in order to engineer consensus. Hannah Arendt, with reference to one of the darkest periods of our recent history, analyzed how a new language, a new lexicon was constructed by the Nazi regime in order to turn what is unthinkable into something that is thinkable and acceptable by, by people, even the most educated ones. More recently, Václav Havel wrote a cogent testimony where he denounced the manipulation of words and notions with a view to strengthening the domination of a regime on the population of former Czechoslovakia. Well, beyond the inherent diversity, these thinkers all noted the extraordinary and euphemistic constructs can acquire once they are produced by governmental institution and repeated by the public. In other words, production and repetition are two sides of the same coin. My presentation will focus on return policies, which in my opinion, constitutes a clear illustration of the challenges I've just mentioned in this introduction. 
I will focus on how and why the meaning of return has substantially changed over the last two decades or so. Before the turn of a century, it by and large described a free and individual choice on the part of a migrant. But over the last two decades, it has been equated with deportation and expulsion in migration talks. It is important to understand the rationale behind this shift and to highlight its manifold implications. To start with, I identify five main factors in a nutshell. I have only 15 minutes, 20 minutes. The first one, the drive for labor migration temporariness, which has justified the introduction of coercive mechanisms aimed at ensuring the effective departure of regular labor migrants or their expulsion if they're becoming overstayers. The second one, there has been a process of deregulation of labor market policies that has gone hand in hand with the reinforced regulation of international migration by the state administration. These two concomitant processes were not only a response to economic crisis and to the growing politicization of such domestic concerns as the integration of foreigners, citizenship, national identity. Actually, the enhanced media vi visibility of irregular migrants' expulsion constituted, and still constitutes, by the way, the most explicit form of state interventionism, above all in a context marked by the perceptible withdrawal of a state from the state on assets, the crisis of the welfare state. We are living the crisis, the crisis of the welfare state today with this uh, COVID-19, and unrestrained and industrial delocalization. The third point, the third factor lies in the widespread and extraordinary diffusion of a dichotomy opposing so-called voluntary with enforced return in the framework of repeated intergovernmental initiatives. I will come to it at a later stage. The fourth factor, uh, refers to the reg refugee regime of Western countries, which has totally been formed over the last 30 years, 40 years. During the Cold War, the refugee regime um, was designed to welcome refugees from the East and to res resettle them in the West. After the Cold War, it became a selective, if not an exclusionary regime designed to keep out asylum seekers from the South. The, the last factor, and it is linked to the one which I've just mentioned, uh, refers to the change of meaning of the word return and the introduction of voluntary return programs, which were instrumental in bringing a refugee convention into play. I'm referring to Article 1, Paragraph C.4 of the 1951 Refugee Convention. This paragraph states that the convention shall cease to apply to any person who has voluntarily re-established himself in the country which he left or outside which he remained owing to fear of persecution. So the, the reference to voluntariness in the return process became a pivotal element of the whole infrastructure governing asylum in the West and elsewhere. But what? Well, today, we know that despite the seemingly impeccable references to voluntariness, the line between voluntary and enforced return has turned to, to be too blurry, given the security-driven purposes this political construct has served. Various researchers across disciplines have investigated the implications of migrant safety and well-being stemming from the so-called assisted voluntary programs. Often, 
they showed that consent has been obtained through pressure or blackmail, making the voluntary dimension precisely what the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe denounced when it adopted in 2010 Resolution 1742, calling on the member states of the Council of Europe to ensure that, I quote, assisted voluntary return programs are indeed voluntary, that migrants' consent is not obtained under pressure or blackmail, and that they have access to independent and impartial actors in the return process to make free and informed decisions. Four years later, in 2014, the International Law Commission adopted the draft articles on the expulsion, on the expulsion of aliens. Just like the Parliamentary Assembly of the Council of Europe, the International Law Commission raised the issue of undue pressure exerted by the expelling state authorities on migrants with a view to forcing them to leave. In its commentary of Article 21, the International Law Commission stressed, stressed that, I quote, the expelling state shall not exert undue pressure on the alien to opt for voluntary departure, end of quote. More recently, the European Court of Human Rights in November 2019 condemned Finland for not having complied with Article 2 and 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights by considering that the voluntary departure of a, re of a rejected asylum seeker puts an end to his victim status and that he could no longer be regarded as a, as a potential victim of any violation of the convention, especially Article 2, a right to life, and Article 3, uh, prohibition of uh, torture. And so the court concluded that despite the signature of an assisted voluntary return form prepared, by the way, by the IOM office in Helsinki, the rejected asylum seeker never returned voluntarily to his country of origin, but had left as a result of the execution of an, of an enforceable expulsion order issued by the state of, of Finland. The court sees no reason to doubt that he would, have, he would not have returned there under the scheme of, of assisted voluntary return had it not been for the enforceable removal order issued against him. Consequently, his departure was not voluntary in terms of his free choice. Hence, the responsibility of, of Finland was engaged. Well, beyond the technicalities, technicalities of these three uh, examples, I would like that they share two common denominators. Firstly, the awareness that some voluntary return programs may have been intentionally used to coerce migrants into leaving the territory of their host countries while engaging state responsibility. Secondly, expulsion has implications in international law that sophisticated euphemisms cannot disguise. Well, perhaps never before has the need to make a clear cut distinction between return and expulsion. Um, this is um, a distinction which is relevant, relevant both politically, legally, and analytically. And it is essential in realizing that its implications for migrants, that the, this is that the implications for migrants are extremely uh, diverse. And expulsion epitomizes the brutal interruption of a migration cycle, having severe implications for migrant safety, well being, and opportunities to reintegrate. Well, to conclude, the reflection that I'm presenting today is not aimed at denouncing the banal usage of euphemisms and double talk, which has consistently permeated policy discourses. This is a reflection which is aimed at explaining that using return as a euphemism to refer to expulsion inevitably deflects policy attention from the real causes of the problem and from the need to respond to migrant safety and human rights. Indeed, 
equating return with expulsion constitute a denial of migrants' human conditions in the broadest sense. More prob problematically, the uncritical acceptance of this figure of speech reflects an alignment with a powerful narrative that has gradually dispossessed migrants from their own agency and rights. Interviews with migrants cannot but reveal the absurd inconsistency of these pervasive euphemisms. I would like to stop here just because there will be a debate and I thank you for, for your attention. I think I have, um, how would I say, I have tackled you know, most of the issue that I wanted to, uh, uh, to address. Uh, I could speak much more, but I think it's important to leave the floor to my colleague just for the sake of, uh, you know, uh, the, for the sake of time, actually. So thank you so much for your attention. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre, for this enlightening intervention. Uh, I think we will have the occasion to, to come back and to, to go more, more in depth on, on the point that you uh, that you present uh, now. I will give the floor to, to Joanna, who will present uh, um, uh, an intervention state violence or failed return. Uh, the floor is yours, Joanna. Thank, thank you. you so much, Lorenzo. And thank you, Jean Pierre, for opening this kind of great discussion. Um, I will entertain you with a PowerPoint. So let me see first if I manage to get there. Um, the surprise is that the title of my presentation is quite different. And um, let's see, first to move this. Can you see it now? Yes, we can see. Okay, great. Joanna, it's perfect. Okay, I was not sure. <laughs> so you can see it, you can hear me. So, um, yeah, the full title of this paper would have been political emotion of state violence operating humiliation while forcing the mobility of EU citizens. But just to give you a bit of a context. Um, so I'm working on this project It's not, um, you know, shaped and final paper that I'm uh, writing right now. But there is a reflection on my field work that I've different fieldworks actually that I've conducted in Spain and in France between 2014-2017. And um, this fieldwork was, I mean, I came across the phenomenon and it's so related to what Jean-Pierre just uh, explained, this kind of ambivalence of voluntary and forced return, especially when it comes to Eastern European. Of course, uh, it was easier for me to uh, look at Romanian citizens um, who are EU citizens, but they are not in Schengen. So they, it's, it's quite of a difference there of the border regime, but nevertheless, the rights of EU citizens applies to all of them. So um, this was uh, how my interest started in the phenomena. And then I looked at evictions, expulsions, forced mobility and deportation practices. And I tried to make sense, how is this happening against your citizens? And um, yeah, it is a very important point to link to the presentation of Jean-Pierre that uh, we do have an we, we accommodate, we tolerate, we uh, learn how to speak the language of the uh, government in what it is and what it's not, you know, the right of mobility. But we at the same time think that we are all in the same right of mobility. And I think that the last year was um, so clear for all of us how painful it is actually to have borders closed, to have this imposed um, immobility. Uh, I'm just making a small disclaimer. The PowerPoint would have some photos that might be disturbing. So please bear with me. Um, so Besides the field work, the paper I'm presenting now reflects also my personal experiences that added to the data gathered from the field work. In a strict Foucauldian sense, torture and humiliation were punishing measures applied to the body of the criminal. 
modernity supposedly abandons torture in favor of much sophisticated mechanisms of controlling and disciplining bodies. A lesser evident constant of the penal society is humiliation. Often interpreted as a painful individual emotion, humiliation's collective dimension and public impact assign it to the palette of political emotions that control and corrode our social fabric. Political emotions are socially constructed affects cultivated and maneuvered in a more or less explicit way to control and discipline people and communities. Emotions have been theorized in organizations and especially in the work of the state. Scholars have emphasized the instrumentalization of emotions in politics and society and the way in which they shape and form political communities. The socially mediated emotions like shame, guilt, security or humiliation contribute to our sense of belonging and differentiation. In line with these theories, my paper addresses and theorizes on those political emotions that are shaped at the border crossing and while exercising mobility on the EU uh, territory. My data and my experience showed how similar practices are embraced by both state and non-state agents, my target groups. On the one hand, state agents are the police officers or employees in different structures that have a direct contact with EU mobile citizens, such as immigration officers working within local or central public authority. On the other hand, non-state agents are not employed within the state structures, but in different roles, they act as state proxies. They can be ground airline personnel, airport employees, NGO workers legally advising migrants in detention centers or interpreters working for administrative and judicial courts. In a way, all of them are street level bureaucrats, as Lipsky put it. They manage and help normalizing a political system that inflicts violence against some EU citizens. One of these methods to inflict violence, which is largely used, is humiliation. I aim to problematize the systemic nature of violence applied to Eastern European citizens who are border crossers and poor. Not only are they submitted to forms of confinement and displacement, but constantly experience humiliation. These EU citizens whose mobility is controlled and forced across Europe attest that humiliation is part of their interaction with state agents or is experienced as consequence of state sanction practices. On a daily basis, emotions are intrinsic part of the policing, voluntary and bureaucratic work of people implementing the migration and deportation laws and policies. Emotions are visible, manifested and analyzed at the bureaucratic interface between EU mobile citizens and civil servants or street level bureaucrats. Particularly, I aim to show that humiliation is central in the work of street level bureaucrats who work alongside the migration deportation apparatus. Humiliation as form of state violence is instrumental in targeting certain population for dehumanization and destitution. Humiliation in the sense of dislocation and dehumanization places those who are humiliated victims out of our imagined communities, beyond our political realm. The humiliated ones stop being humans like us even if only temporary. Humiliation as a political concept helps revealing practices that violate human dignity at best sustaining racism and sexism in Europe. Emotions and affects have been identified and diagnosed throughout the labor spe spectrum. Scholars have shown how community and social society level factors beyond individual level once also influence the contagion of emotions at work. Discretionary practices of forced mobility, stop and search, evictions, mobility denials, deportations confirm the shaming mechanism developed, maintained and enacted within the state, nation state racist patriarchal logic. To exemplify how I attend to this concept, I choose one event 
where violence and humiliation are revealed as acceptable in society at large. Deconstructing this event along patterns of intersectional dynamics, we will disclose the revival of public humiliation practices in our cosmopolite society. The event that I'm talking about takes place in uh, Madrid, Plaza del Sol, 2016, just before Eindhoven football team played against Atletico Madrid. I chose this video because despite its bad quality, uh, it captures the participation of different actors best exposing normalized social dynamics and conflictual ethics. So bear with me and let's have a look on this one. Hola jóvenes, buenas tardes. A veces el fútbol es el reflejo de la sociedad, ¿no? De las miserias de la sociedad. Ha ocurrido en la Plaza Mayor de Madrid. Aficionados del PSV denigrando a unas mujeres, a unas mujeres que pedían limosna. Nos situamos en el centro de Madrid, Plaza Mayor. Un grupo de aficionados del PSV beben antes del partido. En el centro de la plaza, un grupo de señoras piden limosna. De repente les tiran unas monedas. ...rápidamente se agachan para cogerlas. Las señoras se quedan a la espera de más... ...y los aficionados del PSV... ...lo convierten en un divertimento. Han montado una fiesta de las penurias ajenas. La imagen es bochornosa... del esperpéntico espectáculo aparece este hombre los aficionados del PSV lejos de avergonzarse se mofan la situación se vuelve muy tensa pero los aficionados siguen tirando monedas Esas que aparece la policía y decide desalojar a las señoras de la plaza. Ellas antes de salir aún se afanan para recoger las últimas monedas. Una imagen penosa que ha divertido a los aficionados del PSV. Hola jóvenes, buenas tardes. A veces el fútbol es el... This was supposed to stop. Um, indeed, the recording shows various actors, poor women who are not stateless, but Romanian citizens, most probably of Roma ethnicity, Spanish citizens, international tourists, the Dutch football supporters, and the Spanish police. My attention goes to the last group, the Spanish police and their position. Through their action and in the name of the state, the police officers enforce the laws that reflect the ethics of our society. Through their intervention in the scene, by way of ending a disruptive public order event, the police actively draw the line between those who belong and those who do not. Despite the moral condemnation exhibited by some Spanish citizens against the Dutch tourists, the Spanish police acted against the poor Roma women. The police action demonstrates the role of the state agents in perpetrating violence by allowing public humiliation. This is what I call the both state sanctioned practices. Thus, the state makes its appearance by enforcing the law to maintain public order. At the same time, its action shifts the moral condemnation from the perpetrators towards the poor, gendered and racialized victims of humiliation the state through its representatives, does so without being challenged by Spanish citizens. Yet, it was so by the Dutch football fans who protested having their fun over. As expected, the police intervention does not steal resilience from the humiliated women. The police present, uh, presence in this case reaffirms the jolly act of public humiliation and the normalization of violence in our society. Informally, expressing emotions and values at work is part of building a community. These attitudes of state and non-state agents against poor EU citizens are never trivial, 
but indicate the effective dimension of state contributions in shaping political communities. Moreover, the public dimension of humiliation makes it reasonable that acts of humiliation to be enacted in the daily work of state and non-state agents. Humiliation is acceptable, unaccountable, and helps strengthen the social morals against the other. But exactly for this reason, we should question the problematic practices of forced mobility, evictions and expulsions in Europe. They should be exposed as humiliating practices in the light of suffered consequences. And uh, at the end, I would really like to challenge and maybe open up the, the discussions to ask you uh, and challenge your political imagination and ask, uh, where does hope come from? Uh, can our moral compass be enriched by new political emotions? Or did we become all too numb to others' sufferings? And I will end here. Uh, thank you so much. Let me see if I can quickly stop sharing my screen. Yes, I've managed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joanna. Oh, There's also a uh, quite inter interesting and, and very deep uh, presentation. And, and although the, the questioning point that you raised, Jean-Pierre and, and Joanna, it's nice to have uh, enough time for, for a real debate. And thank you very much for the time management. That was absolutely uh, perfect. Um, I'm supposed to be the discussant, but I would prefer to give the floor uh, to the public and I will keep my comments for, for later on. Uh, I don't know if there are already some some intervention i see that i don't see any questions um, see. but if any i see would that like ivan I, ivan martin yeah. has some oh, comments yeah. and some question in the chat i don't know if it's possible it does his, his microphone as is, is open it can intervene or not i don't know ivan if you want to to share your comments and question for the general public. Okay, okay. I thought it was not possible. Hi, <laughs> hi. Well, I, I, I have uh, one comment and two questions, actually, one for each of you. The comment refers, uh, I will start by the comment. The comment refers to Jean-Pierre presentation. I, I really appreciate that being a very known expert on return and readmission, you have made the effort to talk about return and expulsions without any reference to readmission. Because I think it is high time that we understand that these are two completely different processes, even if they are sequential, and they have different implications uh, in terms of uh, uh, human rights, in terms of uh, legal implications, political implications. So I really appreciate to, uh, the effort, which is not easy, because they are often amalgamated now, the effort to deal with uh, return and expulsion as an independent issue and, and to analyze the implications separately from readmission, which is of course now uh, 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 joined uh, very often with uh, return. My two questions to you, I will be very brief. Uh, I will start by uh, Joanna. Joanna, I I'm, uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. I found it very complimentary actually to the one by, by Jean-Pierre. I, I have one issue on terminology, as you may have read. Uh, uh, I mean, you entitled your uh, presentation State Violence and, and Public Emotions or something like that. Anyway, in, li in listening to you, I would say that it is not a state violence, it is a state terrorism. And the objective is very clear that, and this has some implications which are interesting. So I, 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 I would like you to discuss that. I mean, the way you refer to the use of public humiliation as a structural feature of state control of a specific uh, 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 discriminated groups, for me, refers very clearly to deliberate use of violence by the state, irregular violence, illegal violence, actually, according to the uh, uh, law of, of, of the state, and, and as such, state terrorism. 
whatever the implica I'm very aware of the implications of this expression. Yeah? I, I'm using it on purpose. And for uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, the issue is, uh, uh, I, I found your presentation very inspiring and I, I share uh, all of it. It was very useful uh, for me, but I would like you to elaborate on how this approach can be made compatible with the right, legal right of every state to decide who is entitled to remain in its territory and who is not, uh, and call it return or expulsion. But basically, this right is legally very clear according to international law. Even morally uh, or politically, it can be defended with the exception of those migrants in need, in, in humanitarian need, where there is a prevailing uh, obligation of assistance, of course. But this is not always the case for many of the return or expulsed uh, migrants. So I would like to, you to, to reflect on that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Evan. I think we can, as we have time, we, you, if you want to, we can answer question by question. So I don't know, Joanna, maybe if you want to start. Yeah. Sure, I, I, I can go. Thank you so much, Ivan, for, for your question. Uh, I totally agree with you. We can call it state terrorism, and it is uh, like that. Uh, I think that also Jean-Pierre might agree with me in the larger sense of what means this kind of uh, public practices, uh, state violence, and its outcome. Um, I, I think that my presentation was indeed complementary mm -hmm. in that sense that we might think that uh, return and, you know, the action of the state are just, um, you know, a cozy and nice recommendation to move on, but it's never like that. And even in this kind of day-to-day uh, -day, uh, actions and day-to-day -day encounters with the others that are unwelcome, uh, it's a lot of violence that is involved. Of course, uh, what I wanted to show, I um, have to say sorry that the, 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 the video was in Spanish, but uh, with no subtitles in English. So if, yeah, uh, that, that was something. But I, I think that it's quite explicit, even if it's somebody that doesn't understand, you know, the, the commentators. Uh, the point is quite clear that the police never disrupted the Dutch uh, football fans, which is unbelievable in that sense, if you think. But yeah, so uh, in that sense, we have to make a, a clear distinction and to really look into the actions of the state that it's never like you so well put it, you know, it's never neutral, it's never like innocent or it doesn't have another uh, clear uh, program. And I, I, on that, I will leave it to Jean-Pierre because it links so well to what he said about the, the shrinkage of the welfare states and the fact that this kind of vocabulary uh, gets so normalized, you know, that we need to uh, get rid of the others. It's, uh, it's our right to uh, decide who, who we welcome, like it is a we that is already decided. So on the legal uh, aspect, I will give it to Jean-Pierre. Okay. Thanks. Yeah, thank you so much. And uh, well, just, in by order, let's say, first of all, I, I say hello to uh, Ivan Martin. Uh, thank you also to uh, to you for, for this question. Um, I have, I, I would like to reply to you, but my question, my reply will be based on a question because, you know, uh, you said, of course, well, readmission, I hope we all agree on the fact that readmission is first of all a notion which uh, was, mm, let's say, instituted uh, more or less 25, 30 years ago. It was a way of dealing with a form of expulsion, clearly. And readmission is a form of expulsion. I hope we all agree on that. And it has nothing to do with return. Although we, I know that we have return policies or they are coined this way, you know, in Europe, I'm aware of that, of course, absolutely. And I, I know, of course, but what I would like to, to show, and this is what I tried to do uh, in, in the framework of this short presentation, there are impl implications, which are not only 
um, um, I would say epistemological, they are legal. In other words, you cannot uh, disguise, you know, your own action with euphemisms, which anyway uh, will have an impact on the rights of people inevitably. And this is what uh, the parliamentary assembly of the Council of, Euro of Europe denounced in a, similar, in, a, in a similar vein, the International Law Commission, and more recently, the uh, European Court for Human Rights. So what I find extremely interesting, a bit worrying also, is that it's almost thanks to the European Court uh, on, human, on Human Rights that actually we could have a more clarity on the usage of this word, you know, voluntary return as opposed to enforced return. Uh, this is a political construct having implications from a legal point of view. And this is what, uh, what we realized, thanks actually to, well, legal, uh, to a legal action uh, at the level of the European uh, uh, at the, at the European Court for Human Rights in Strasbourg. I think it's absolutely interesting, you know, to, uh, to realize all that uh, to, to some extent. Uh, well, uh, and another point, um, um, what, what I, I mean, the distinction I made, um, you said, how, how does it, uh, how is it compatible with the right of a state to decide absolutely who can enter and who uh, cannot. Uh, I think this is this is a bit. It's really different. Uh, what I what I try to do beyond you know this uh, sovereign right of each state to decide who can enter its own territory and who cannot. What I try to do in the framework of my short presentation was to show that, um, well, if states, and also the EU, by the way, but here in Europe, if European member states tend to use a euphemism to speak actually about expulsion, because these people are expelled people, in other words, in practice, and when you, when you, uh, when you carry out a field survey, when you interview migrants, and I think that empirical work is, uh, uh, in a compelling manner, uh, uh, enlightening, uh, because when you ask them, you know, um, do you think, I mean, was, I mean, did you return to your country or do you think you were expelled to your country? And they say, well, in, in, in North Africa, when I interviewed a lot of migrants, most of them, they say in Arabic, tam tarheli. Tam tarheli means I was expelled. You know, if they never said, uh, Raja to bladi. Uh, they said, "I never, I, you know, uh, I, I came back to my country." Not, not very rarely, you know, especially when it when it comes to voluntary return programs. Absolutely, this is, you know, the, the way in which they view it, indeed. And I think this concrete vision uh, of the process is is, I mean, really, it sheds light light on the manipulation of words. And it's extremely important to realize that uh, because it has an impact on the ways in which these, per these people can or cannot reintegrate back home. Uh, when you speak about you know, voluntary return programs, of course, statistically speaking, and it's a sociological truth, but out of 100 people who had uh, a voluntary return, so-called voluntary return programs, you know, they benefited from a voluntary return programs. Maybe one or two or three people will say, well, it was great. And of course, it's, it's a sociological truth. Inevitably, there will be a minority, but the vast majority of these people, believe me, it's, it ha and there's no reintegration no ability actually to take part in the uh, in the economic, so social, and even political life of the of the country of origin. It's extremely difficult from that point of view. Despite the fact that they are, it is coined 
a return and there's a whole um, a whole propaganda <laughs> around all these programs uh, absolutely so but this goes beyond in my opinion the uh, the uh, uh, well the sovereign right of each state you know to decide who enters and who cannot anyway uh, that's it thank you <laughs> if i can uh, add uh, just a, um, a thought here because i i totally agree with you with you this use of euphemism and i think in 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 french it's so telling how uh, or also you know, in english <laughs> <laughs> also in English, absolutely. But in, in, in French, I was, uh, you know, I really had initially to adjust because everybody would tell me, no, no, you didn't get it right. It's éloignement. It's not de deportation. So you never use deportation, you know, because it really it's so linked to, um, to a historical event. And the, the key link is too painful for the... <laughs> Uh, collective uh, identity of the French uh, Republican. Um, but yeah, even at, a, at an, if I may add something to what okay. you're saying, the, the notion of expulsion, for example, is it, from a legal point of view, is extremely problematic because at the level of the EU member states, I mean, at the level of the EU, and we are, well, we are a new a union of member states. We are not a federation. It's very different, of course. And so, in the framework of a union of states, each state has its own definition of expulsion. That's why it was impossible, you know, when long before the adoption, uh, the entry into force of the uh, return directive in 2009, it was impossible, you know, to introduce an expulsion, a European expulsion policy. Uh, instead, a European return policy was possible because it, 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 it was able to go beyond the divergences uh, in terms of definition, in terms of legal definition of what is expulsion. And so that's why they invented this notion also at that time. And be, during the 1990s, the Euro European Commission spoke about expulsion. It never talked about return. <laughs> Absolutely. It, it, European, you have a lot of communiques during the 1990s on the European Commission, which spoke, which really elaborated on an EU expulsion policy. But then there was, from a legal point of view, uh, you know, a tricky aspect, you know, because France has its own definition, Italy, Germany. Uh, it was difficult to combine all these realities uh, and tradition, legal tradition. So that's why they decided to opt for another term. And then this is how it, uh, we know the, the whole story afterwards. <gasps> On empathy, I would like to say something, if I may, yes. because I think it's a crucial aspect, indeed. But the issue, actually, actually, um, I would say intellectually speaking, analytically speaking, how can we, uh, how can we create, uh, you know, this, um, this continuum? Yes this continuum between the condition of, for example, these Roma ladies, you know, who were picking the money in the square. So a, a continuum between these Roma ladies and the EU, uh, and sorry, and the other people who were watching, who were present in the square. And uh, there's a man, there's a lady uh, who said, well, this is not, you, you, you cannot do that. I mean, it's in, uh, you should not do that. You're, uh, mm -mm. okay. And, but the majority of these, uh, uh, of these young, I mean, of, of, of the public, let's say, the, the, the one which was, which was the most noisy, let's say, uh, throwing, you know, the coins to the lady and they were amused, you know, by all that. And I, I don't see any empathy, but there was, uh, let's say, a, a modicum of, of empathy, you know, in the in the attitude of this man and this lady, if you remember, in the, in the yeah. And so the, the question is the following, you know, well, uh, how can I mean, what was the spark, you know, which made this man and this lady behave this way? There's, can we call it empathy, or can we call it outrage? 
the, the feeling that I would not accept that someone treats me this way. And I don't want someone else to be treated this way also. Um, there's a, in a, if I may, I think I, I, this issue is crucial. Politically speaking, it is crucial. Crucial because it determines a, a lot of aspects and, and it should promote a, a new reflection, you know, about even the research on migrants. Because it's, it's great that we have books, we have movies, we know the ordeal of migrants, you know. Everybody knows that people are dying in the desert. People are dying crossing the, but still all that continues. And there's, well, apart from, I'm not talking about these heroic migrant aid associations or whatever, I mean, who are really doing a great job, you know, trying to, you know, to raise their voice and to show, but today even showing, you know, the, uh, um, the plight, the plight of migrants, it's, they, I mean, it seems to me that we have been like accustomed, you know, to this uh, horror. And, um, and it reminds me of what? It reminds me um, of an essay of Hannah Arendt, a beautiful one, when she, in Essays in Understanding, there's one essay in which she's extremely harsh, even with those who denounced, you know, the, um, uh, the plight and the terrible, the dreadful conditions of uh, Jewish people in Europe, you know, say, because, because she was even denouncing that they were just, if I remember the word, um, you know, she, they were wallowing, wallowing in the denunciation of something which was not no longer acceptable from their point of view, but still it was there and, and it was extremely powerful from that point of view. And she had no excuse for anybody. She was extremely, uh, um, very, very harsh, actually, where we could argue against her and maybe have more nuance, maybe, I don't know, I don't know. But it's, 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 it's an essay which is so important and which makes us reflect, you know, on all that. Is showing a movie, is writing a book on, you know, the condition of M M Mamadou who is uh, crossing, you know, the desert and who arrived in Europe and the suffering, all of, will it solve anything? Uh, in my opinion, no, no longer. Now, no. And empathy is the key, but the, the, the key of the key is actually to, to create a continuum between the conditions of migrants and the conditions of non-migrants, you, me, uh, you know, and trying to show that there's something between these two groups that policymakers tend to separate in their rhetoric, you know. Uh, uh, as you said, yeah, I, th I think you said it so well. I mean, the, the, in the politics, it's it's so split it, and like uh, you mentioned in the in the video, the the, the empathy, but it might be the outrage. It's so much actually to uh, deconstruct in that one because it's not only uh, the Roma as the others, but it's the the you know the wealthy tourist from North Europe coming to a Southern European country and behaving like would probably not behave on their own, you know, they would probably immediately call the police themselves. So uh, it's, it's a lot to unpack there. And I think it's yeah. worth thinking of what brings us as a political community, as Europeans, what are the moral values that we stand for? Mm -hmm. And that should be reflected in our policies, in the policies that we support, you know, when we vote, when we protest against what the politicians are doing. Mm -hmm. But most often we do not do that because it's such an active um, state, uh, you know, uh, the, the state is not passive, it's actively uh, hiding the way that is doing. And what you say, the euphemism, 
it's one way of hiding what the practices are and what is the effect of you know just raising and putting billions into frontex not to mention mm. other things right so i think we have to have in mind that there is no passivity uh, from the part of the state it's something pretty active and quite directional so in this video for example that's why i've mentioned it the police you know to, i mean it was a clear choice to intervene against the poor and not against the wealthy and this is our, uh, you know, the paradigm of, of the nation states, yes. European states. There's a point uh, which uh, Ivan uh, raised, uh, you know, in the chat. Maybe you don't, you don't see it. I can read it to you if you want. But you cannot have social oh, okay, equality and empathy with economic inequality locally and even more internationally. A new world economic order is the, the only way out to ensure the continuum. I agree. That's why. We have to reconsider a whole framework, you know, a whole system and a whole order, as you put it, Ivan. I agree. Of course, it's linked with in with inequalities. Absolutely, okay. it's not linked only with you know you and me. Except, actually, policymakers are happy when we speak about them, uh, us. You know these binary distinctions. You know, and um, especially well. Uh, when uh, there's a such a crisis of the welfare state, when the state has been, has withdrawn itself from the economy. We see it, at least, uh, well, in, in many countries. We Jean -Pierre, see it. Sorry, yes. Jean-Pierre and, and Joanna, just, uh, uh, just, just a comment on what you are, are, are uh, discussing. Um, I think that, I mean, that's a central point is of empathy and also, as you mentioned it, uh, Jean-Pierre, uh, on making acceptable the unacceptable. And that is a very, very important for me, symbolic element of this policy that happens at two levels. First of all, it's happened at, at, uh, at an internal, let's say, an internal level. And I would, uh, would raise the, the, the decision on how this, this deportation or expulsion policies are related to other processes of othering inside Europe, because finally uh, we are we are talking about something that that's that is unacceptable ethically and, and normatively because also of the consequences and the factual effect of these policies. So you mentioned uh, the interruption of migration circle, the the humiliation. Um, uh, the, the torture in some sense, because we have to consider that finally, I mean, deportation is not applicable to all uh, people, foreigners in a regular situation, but it's just on a little part of this. So it's very symbolic policies. Uh, Nicolas de Genova, for example, talks about the portability, you know, and the fact that finally you don't want to deport everyone, it's just to produce this feeling of exactly. the possibility of being deported that I think is very central in, in mm. this mechanism of, mm. of creating terror mm. on people. On, on, on a kind of psychological torture in some sense that's still mm. active all the time along the, the, the staying in, in a regular condition in a country, mm. no? And Definitely. even when you're a part of you, uh, of you as, as the case of Roma, of Roma people exposed by, by France and Spain. And from the other, so how, how this, this, this policy and these practices of state interact um, with, with larger process of, of fathering and also from the other side how these processes of fathering that also pass through the, 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 the deportation and, and the expulsion uh, connect with another process very symbolic and very important at European level that's the creation of the Europeans of new identity uh, and this is my 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 first comment I will let the following one for later on <laughs> also to keep open the floor to, to the public May I say something on, on yeah, what you just said very quickly, very quickly, I promise, one minute. Well, we tend to forget very often, in my opinion, that uh, the EU is just like the member states confronted with, um, with expectations on the part, not of its constituencies. The, constitu the constituencies of the EU is the member states to some extent, okay? And then we, there is the people of Europe to say. Um, and so in, in a context where expectations are high, the EU has to be responsive also. 
not only to the member states, but at least, you know, but also to the, from a symbolic point of view and from a even political point of view in order to have the legitimacy, you know, to preserve its own legitimacy to act as it is acting. Let's go back very quickly in September, 2020, the new pact on migration and asylum, which is which hinges on exp on expulsion on readmission. Anyway, uh, everything is dependent well on how actually third countries will cooperate or not. Because if we realize all the provisions which are contained in this new pact, if th if third countries decide. It will never happen collectively uh, to say, well, we don't want to cooperate with the EU on this new pact, etc. Well, this new pact is a non-event, in other words. That's why there is a great deal of pressure. Now, you, you've read maybe the last decision from the um, uh, Commission, which is indeed in the wake of the new pact, to insist again on the conditionality between visas, visa policies and readmission. Wait and see, I say. We will see how things will develop. But th there's a great deal of rhetoric. Why? It's the rhetoric, the symbolic around all that. The need for the EU to show that it is doing something. That's, that's it. There's perhaps nothing else to, to investigate, I would say. The EU needs to show that it is acting. Is it effective or not? This is another question. Okay, but we are doing something. And absolutely, there's this obsession on the part of Brussels, you know, on the subsidiarity principle, you know, the need to complement, to add value to what the member states are doing. Good. But, well. anyway. I, I, I totally agree with you. You know, it's, it's so good that you said it, the, the fact that this pact would have no value if, third countries will not cooperate. But the idea is that the EU and the member states, they are really doing their best to have these agreements. And the, the, the old idea with the Dividate Impera works pretty well. So we do have already uh, good, some work, some not, you Turkey, you Morocco, you Libya, they are beginning, and not to mention the informality of all this kind of. Uh, yeah. may, may I right. may I say so, something? Yeah, you're right, uh, Johanna, in, indeed. But remember, in 2016, when the new partnership framework was introduced, we had the same the same fuss, politically speaking. Everybody, wow, that's a new partnership framework. It's fantastic. I remember in Italy, we had uh, Renzi who was speaking about the compacts, you know, he was saying that he was at the origin of this idea, beautiful idea. Anyway, and so everybody was expecting a lot. Well, five years later, you know, what do we have? Actually, a few compacts. Uh, disappointing results also because everybody was hoping to expel more and more people and it was well look at the, the statistics of Eurostat they are uh, they show that something is going wrong you know uh, but maybe the expected outcome is not is not there and uh, so uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit I don't know what to say. It sorry, sorry. Like, uh, you, you sound like it's, you are optimist, like these things will not work, but the, 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 the amount of money that it's poured into Frontex to actually collect all the deportees and to take over, and not to mention the... You cannot deport a, a person without the, the, the consent of a sovereign state. So as long as the issue of travel documents is not solved, and this is a big issue apart from redocumentation, identification, and many other aspects again. So, uh, but I don't know what to say, but I think it's, this is a sad development. Uh, the new partnership framework in 2016 opened the Pandora's box on informality, as you put it. 
Absolutely. It's a terrible development and nobody will stop it. Nobody. And when we see the new pact on migration and asylum of last year, it will continue. There's no reconsideration of this uh, dangerous informalization process because it goes beyond parliamentary oversight. When the parliament adopted a motion in December last year, uh, saying that, well, it's not okay. Uh, um, there's a lot of, uh, there are a lot of agreements which are becoming informal at a supranational level. We, we want to have a say. Okay, so, uh, and, um, but well, the Euro European Parliament, uh, I don't know, some, uh, looks a bit uh, powerless in this context, unfortunately. That's the situation. That's why the Pandora's box is open. I don't know who will close it. I don't know. I will confirm it. I mean, looking at the, at the situation of Canary Island uh, in, in, the last, uh, in the last month and, and the, the practices and the policy of the Spanish state, first of all, there's this buffering people there and waiting for, for supposed deportation of, of all these people that's still, I mean, difficult for, for every one of these, but at the same time also the informal practices of, of deportation of third country citizens to Mauritania and we see again the same dynamics of informal negotiation with third countries, some of them are more, uh, more uh, open in this sense and it's also important to keep in mind that the Malian people are being deported to Mauritania in the case of Malian I think is reconnected to what you mentioned about um, the the asylum and the deterioration of the asylum system. So in this sense, as deportation of Malian that you cannot deport in Mali, but you will send back to Mauritania because supposedly they have crossed from there. So there's mm. still happening and the very informal term, still marginal. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I will add, I don't know until which point this, this policy has also supposedly linked with a part of performativity and this kind of theatrical performance uh, of, uh, of European countries and, and the institution, uh, but also to, to the fact of, deter of the supposed idea of deterrence, because we know from the field research that, that deterrence is not working. And then I want to open with you that have extensive experience in field research about, uh, about factual consequences of the of this return that I think is the return, sorry, for the, for the lapses of this, of this deportation, of this expulsion. Do you mean with reference to states or with reference to migrants? To migrants, to people. Oh, yeah. yes. Well, first of all, well, I'm not the only one. There are many other scholars, you know, working on that. Um, Lisa Schuster, Nassim Majidi, uh, um, um, anyway, Gilles Alps also, I mean, I could cite other people, other colleagues, uh, clearly. But well, uh, the conditions of migrants when, once they are deported, uh, I've never, and I did a lot of interviews in Morocco, in Algeria, uh, Tunisia, uh, also in Mali, because we carry out a survey over there in Mali. Well, people who are deported, I say, it's, it is, and this was also mentioned by Joanna, I mean, it's so humiliating. But the, the only, I would say the common denominator is the following. I am humiliated. I need to show to my community that I can make it. So I want to leave again for abroad and I will make it anyway. They don't solve anything, absolutely. Uh, there's no, um, but there's a whole propaganda on assisted voluntary returns, absolutely. Uh, pro programs, uh, absolutely. This is, uh, this is well known, but well, it, it, it again refers to what I was saying to you before, that something has to be done. Is it effective or not? This is another question. And it's, it's sad uh, to, to realize that, but you re and you must consider one thing, voluntary return programs, assisted voluntary return programs have never been assessed by an independent body. Don't tell me that they were assessed by IOM. It is, it is a self-assessment, yeah. of course. This is different, of course. And IOM does the self-assessment, absolutely. Uh, very often to say, well, oh, yes, maybe we had some problem. We need more money. <laughs>
very often. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm ironical, but I mean, no, but to, to, to think that public funds were spent, you know, on a project which was uh, uh, on, uh, on a program, and we have no clear evidence of its working effectively. And that's the problem, I'd say, because we need to show that something is being done. Mm. And we need these people to leave the territory. Will they reintegrate? This is a different. Oh, we need to speak about reintegration. It's fashionable, but we it, we don't care actually. It's not. Um, and and there different. is no. If I just were to finish, uh, the, all this is based on projects. You know, and it's interesting. There so there is no a uh, graft, no grafting, onto the local institutional public system. You see? So the, the country of origin, its institutions will never integrate, you know, the rationale, the mechanisms, the, the, the policies or practices which were maybe transferred in the framework of these projects. It's absolutely exogenous. It will be kept there, you know, and it will remain there. So nothing will change. Thank you very much, jean yeah. I don't know if, Joanna, you want to add something on, on the uh, issue. Of, I, I was just reading now what uh, Ivan uh, said on chat, and uh, I, I have also my data uh, because I conducted the research also back in Romania with those that are deported or returned uh, first from Spain, then from France. And yeah, I mean, they it's staggering and you will just, you know, will make laugh anyone that looks at it. So uh, in, in France, uh, LOFI, uh, LOFI is the Francais de l'Integration et Immigration, uh, they had an office till 2017 in Romania. So, uh, which is completely mm -hmm. exceptional. So they, they work only, outside of Europe, they had it there, they had a reintegration program, spent hundreds of thousands uh, of euros for people, and they had four people that they went to the program in all these years, in 10 years since Romania uh, was already joining the EU, and uh, out of four, I don't know, two died, and one returned, went back to France, and the other one, I don't know where. I mean, it's, it's just, you know, ludicrous if you look at that, and, but the money was spent, so that's quite important. Not to mention, this is like, you know, uh, those person that they had to choose to enter this voluntary return and reintegration program, they had to fit a profile that it was unbelievable. Uh, regardless, the, the forced return, those that they, they are deported back to Romania, one deportee in a European Union country uh, means 10,000 euros, the minimum, the bare minimum. And that person will just take the first bus back because they have family back in France. They have everything there. So it's useless to do it, but they spend every time. This is the, the official cost that I got from the you know, people that they work for the, for the French ministry in doing that. So yeah, we have to look at the money. We have to understand why and who is uh, accountable for, for the practices and for the money that is spent. Yeah, totally agree with you. Thank you very much. Uh, let's open a, a round of questions for the floor. I don't know, Carmen, if you're receiving questions or if- An, an interesting uh, experience from Ivan. I led a project formulation process in West Africa, seven countries for the Swiss cooperation, and we hired a consultant to identify good practices or at least acceptable practices in the field of return and reintegration in those countries. He could not find a single good practice ensuring successful reintegration in the, in the seven countries, despite the fact that IOM has a brochure on good practices in return and reintegration in West Africa. I laugh. It's not laughable, actually, but I mean, it's a, it's it's the propaganda which is all around all that, you know. And uh, uh, indeed, indeed, people are becoming aware. Anyway, there's something else I would like to underline with reference to the so-called so-called return shopping, because we speak about voluntary return programs, so-called, you know, and the idea that 
You know, this is a new notion which was created four or five years ago in a communique of the European Commission. And it means for those who don't know, and it's normal if you don't know, it's un understandable. It means it refers to people, migrants, who in, in the eye of the European Commission would, would come from a non-EU country to Europe in order to be expelled afterwards and to benefit from a return, from, from a voluntary return program. Uh, with a lump sum, you know, uh, Joanna was speaking about, you know, the lump sum, which, which is given to each people who, uh, uh, each person per partic who, who participates in these uh, assisted voluntary return programs. But of course, each, mem each member state has its own uh, policy. So maybe the lump sum will be higher in Germany or in France, or and perhaps um, less in Italy or, or Spain. I don't know. I don't know. Anyway, so in the vision of the European Commission, migrants are abusing, you know, this um, uh, heterogeneous system, you know, and they tend to choose, you know, the most profitable country in order to benefit to benefit later from. And we the thing which is surprising. The first time when it was introduced four years ago, um, there was no, I mean, everybody reacted saying, what is your evidence? Do you have statistics on that? Because you are declaring things. And then it was declared again in the new pact on migration and uh, asylum in September, 2020, the reference to return shopping, just like you heard about asylum shopping. So this return shopping again, but now, if you read carefully, there's a reference, a reference to the problem of return shopping. But the next chapter is totally contradictory. It says that actually, well, we need to know more because we have no evidence. So the question is logical. Why do you speak about that? Why do you continue talking about, you know, this return shopping where you depict foreigners as people who abuse, who cheat, you know, a system. Why do you do that? We have, you say that you have no evidence. So why do you continue? And in such an official text, you know, for me, it's puzzling. Um, it's totally, uh, it's staggering. I have no other words. Absolutely, thank you, Jean-Pierre. I don't know if someone in, in the public, uh, Master students, any other else want to to comment or ask? Please feel free. We still have we still have some time, so maybe we can take five ten minutes more after four o'clock if our guests are available. I don't know if this is the case. <laughs> if it's possible, just to unmute and just the question or they have to use yeah. the chat i suppose yeah, that, that would be great if, i suppose yeah. it's possible i'm i'm not familiar with the format but i think it's possible i don't know if someone wants okay, to be in anyone that posts a question or that raises their hand so it's it's possible okay if if people would want me to do that so if okay, anyone puts perfect. up their hand i can unmute them for sure so i will they feel free to, to intervene, to ask and to add to, to the debate, please. Both master student and, and other uh, public attending this round table. No, for the moment. Still have some time. So I will uh, take the occasion as there are no apparently not now uh, about this, this, this policy and again the symbolic element and, and this is relation with the classifying and uh, the hierarchizing people and again to making what what seems unacceptable again acceptable because I think they are the very central dynamic in this in this policy. If we consider the impact in, in, in 
quantitative terms there we know they are very marginal uh, despite their costs uh, quite uh, high first uh, uh, first of all economic cost but also diplomatic cost because it's also part of the game and we not mention it but is i mean it's quite complex and quite difficult to obtain the agreement from a third country um, to to operate uh, uh, to accept this kind of deportation. And this is the case in this day in Senegal, uh, several, I mean, uh, deportation flight from Spain to Senegal was announced in, in two or three occasions and was, uh, uh, was, um, was cancelled for exactly for the, the tense situation in Senegal. So the government won not to add, um, won not to add, uh, uh, dangerous issue to the public debate that's quite uh, intense uh, so in the sense that the, the economic cost that that Joanna also mentioned uh, it's very difficult to find information but it's interesting to know that the internal deportation is around 10,000 euros so we can imagine how much can be in the case of, of citizens of the country extra European countries uh, the diplomatic cost that's quite important and also the psychological, uh, the human cost of this process of deportation, as you mentioned, the result, I mean, the deterrence is not working. And we, don't, we all know uh, after doing field work that this the idea of deterrence is not working even in the victim of this process. And we know that that is not working on, on, on also on other, um, but also in terms of what is called reintegration. And you mentioned it, you know, there's a very difficult process in which people are forced to move again because the, 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 the origin society uh, perceive them uh, as a, I mean, their, they, they, their migration um, project as a failure. So also socially, there is a, a quite strong pressure on them uh, and, and the reintegration that's quite a, um, it's quite a, a trendy concept nowadays and there are increasingly some funding and some project on this term related with, uh, with this uh, voluntary return program so even with a productive return programs uh, is, is, I mean, it's framed for a very specific category of people that not exist. That's considered that from the the, the success story that's going back in his country. While we know that this uh, deportation and even the, what is called voluntary or assisted return concern people that have very difficult experience uh, or are not exactly uh, success story in their in their migration project. So uh, I think is is a quite uh, important element for taking consideration. I don't know if there is some other comments, question from, from the floor, or if you want to react, Johanna and Jean-Pierre. I, I would just say um, one more word to clarify maybe um, his perspective on the EU citizens. Um, the thing is that it might be uh, thought quite exceptional, the case of poor Roma who are targeted. Obviously, they are the most visible and the most exposed in that sense, but the policy works for everyone. So, um, like I have done field work, I've managed that in Spain and France. Now I was supposed to do that also in the UK and it was not possible because of the situation with the pandemic. But by now the UK deports, um, so the first you know, groups that are deported from the UK already in the, in the last years are Eastern Europeans. And not only Romanian citizen, but uh, Polish citizen, Lithuanian, uh, Latvian, and so on. So, this is not something that you know. It's uh, also to go back to the idea of empathy and you know rationalization and realization in what kind of world we live in. We have to pay attention to what's happening on the ground, and that concerns us all. Um, and another element that maybe, yeah, I mean, you all mentioned it at a certain point, and I think it's quite important, uh, is to understand the, the, the private company's interest in all this process and how much they earn and how at all 
accountable or uh, you know transparent these policies are and i'm not just talking about the carriers right the, the because they do they are obliged right to on the deterrence aspect they are obliged to check the identity documents of anyone that transports but it's so much more than that you know it's about software and hardware security providers that uh, we are talking about billions there so yeah i think these policies of the state to to hide its own uh, dealings and its own categorization and logic uh, i think it's quite uh, important to you know have a have an eye on it yeah that, that this is what i was thinking of you know to just wrap up my ideas and yeah uh, this call to to our uh, moral positionality and how do we think with you know um, emotions that are triggered and how important these are to reveal actually what's happening there and not to let us numb not to let us you know immune of what's happening there yeah i i don't know i'm i'm really curious if students would have a good idea thank you very much joanna i just forward. received two question now if you have a little bit more time uh, i don't know your and federica if you want to intervene with your microphone or if you prefer i would read your your comments if you want to intervene with your voice i think it's it's better please Erendira, I don't know if... And Federica, if you want to intervene to just put your question personally. Yeah, wow. that, that I mean, I read the question of Federica and okay. I totally agree with you. Yes, there are emotions. I mean, we have to think that the emotions are not something personal and individual. Of course, they are also, but they are socially constructed emotions that we function as a society. These are things that they glue us together in a in a recognition you know when we talk about solidarity when we talk about empathy when we talk about outrageousness uh, these are things that can be mobilized you know can and you, excuse forward, me you, but i don't yeah, have an, an answer yeah you, you are now, excuse me can you we uh, um, are asking whether you could read the question of federica because participants oh, cannot read yeah. it it would be nice yeah, just to make them more yeah thank you very thank much. you yeah, Ivan. Would, uh, so she asked if we could um argue that those same practices of um, um a state that is creating this humiliation as a public humiliation as a um, deterrence and inflicting violence if we have an alternative to it and can be counter created dismantled and deconstructed right free emotions Yes, I would. I, I think yes, but we have to think together and to mobilize. You know, uh, like hope, like the, the the way that I I I ended the slide. You know, it's one way, but we have to mobilize together and we have to imagine uh, what kind of political community we want to live in. I would say. I don't know. Mm. Thank you very much, Johan. Mm. I don't know, Jean-Pierre, if you want to... Yeah, the issue, just something. to continue, just to add on what Johanna uh, uh, said uh, in a very clear manner, is to, well, uh, what is our role at the same time? I very often ask myself, to be honest with you, you know, uh, I ask myself my, that question, I mean, uh, is it only to analyze, to study, but for, for whom? And, you know, or... Do I want to, I mean, to, to, to transfer a knowledge or do I want to highlight an ignorance? Not the ignorance, don't misunderstand me, not the ignorance of people, the ignorance, the selective, selective ignorance of decision makers, because they know, of course, <laughs> but they discard 
the, the evidence in a, in a context mar marked by, you know, uh, evidence-based research or whatever, the European Commission is always the first to call for evidence-based research. But what does it mean also, uh, apart from this call, which is beautiful, you know, because we have a lot of studies and analysis, statistics. Look at all the forums online which exist on migration matters, on asylum. It's enormous. It's huge. I mean, we, we can have the information. The problem actually is that there's such a huge amount of knowledge that we don't know <laughs> to some extent. <laughs> You know, it's incredible, it's confusing. And it's also science against science. Hmm? We could, it's another seminar. Um, I'm, yes. I'm sorry, uh, I stop here. But I mean, this has to be fought uh, honestly. No. Honestly, really. Otherwise, um, anyway, I stop here, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Pierre and Joanna. Well, I take note of, of your, all your idea for, for the next seminar uh, we'll have in person very soon, I hope. Thank you very much for, Thank you so much. for, for your intervention, your very challenging uh, comments and remarks. It was uh, quite amazing. Um, thank you very much for, for your effort. <laughs> thank you thank so you much for the invitation. And also for the participant and people you. intervene. And thank, so, you. thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you. Bye. And thank, thank you also bye. to all the participants. Thank you. Bye-bye. 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 Bye-bye.